X searches. Hey, everybody, tune in to Recent Tartarian. Recent Tartarian. Recent Tartarian. Join us on another exciting adventure of Exertus. So today is going to be a fun episode because I want to talk a bit about the history of aviation and even some of the prehistory as well, because it seems like people have been talking about ancient flying crafts since the beginning of time, or almost thereabouts, and not often as you might expect for it to be a legend, but just often enough to make you wonder if they're not just accounts of actual flying crafts, and yet we're told that flying crafts have only existed for the last hundred years or so of history, and that they started out pretty dangerous and now we have things that we don't completely understand how they work, but at least they stay in the sky. Which is pretty weird when you start looking into the records of how many Zeppelin and air balloon crashes there have actually been compared to actual aircraft crashes. And granted, there are more jets in the sky, but a lot of them do crash compared to what you might have heard about hot air balloons. And hot air balloons go back even further than that. In fact, I think hot air balloons might be the secret to all of this, but they're so much more interesting and intricate and complicated than anyone really ever gave them time to think. And these super sophisticated pieces of technology, which if you can use a modern lens to imagine how we'll use the same sort of balloons and modern nanotechnology in order to harness the environment around the balloons to command the elements, then you'll see how balloons are a pretty necessary part of our future and and almost certainly a huge part of our past. And now for the obligatory cartoon parable about the Flintstones, the first episode, I believe, of the show, or it's very early on, Barney Rubble invents a flying machine, and Frederick Flintstone, as the neighbor and confidant of Barney Rubble, encourages Barney to facilitate himself in his scheme to avoid work and fly around town and see what others are doing. In many respects, it's an empty plan. It's not to fly, for instance, to the center of town and to the patent office, nor to the government or to the Rockefeller's quarry. Rather, they don't want anyone to know that they have their invention and so they hide it, abusing their monopolized secret and using it to evade their responsibilities instead of seeking out new obligations to help mankind. Enough of the parable, but I think it gives you an idea what I think happened to some of the earlier aero technology. Much of this stuff existed for a very select audience, usually dukes and princes, and before that, shahs, sultans, and emperors. These delicate one-off crafts, often classified for centuries, esoteric military secrets which were created by inventors working underneath these emperors and kings, many of whom adventurers who traveled themselves in these sky vehicles, and something noted in almost all of the patents and drawings and renderings of these inventions are the esoteric allegories of being within the Thunderbird underneath the anthropomorphic sun. So this is a pretty fair history, actually. I think there's nothing wrong with that. The idea that most of history that happened was hidden just for personal gain and that it wasn't necessarily even as broad of an understood technology because only members of fraternities and nobility had this technology. So, of course, it ended up, like, in the 20th century in the hands of corporations who, with their military contracts, could keep classified things copywritten and trademarked and hidden better. But in general, we're taught that these archaic flying devices hardly ever functioned if they were ever constructed at all, and the rudimentary designs for them were simply novelties of the imagination, nothing that could be actually accomplished by man, which is simply untrue. And when you start looking at some of the other renderings of flying vehicles and aerial crafts that were being designed in the 18th and 19th century, The sophistication of some of the more privately held designs far outweigh those of the ones seen in common society. These sketches from the Sonora Aerial Club, particularly the ones from Charles Delshaw, who started the Sonora Aviation Club, detail much more sophisticated plans for 
both metal and inflatable crafts, and perhaps both. The Sonora Aviation Club was started by a number of very important people in the 1800s, by a number of very important Prussians in the 1800s, and in some ways can be considered the Operation Paperclip of the 19th century. However, I'm yet to be convinced that this was entirely a nefarious organization. In fact, it seems like it might have just been an enthusiast society of fanatics whom believed in some rather interesting secrets, for instance, an alternative to the common belief about the shape of the earth, something that they derived from their esoteric interest in the folk arts as well as the Kabbalah, and gave them a very interesting perspective on the universe, even flight itself, in their belief that gravity was a non-item, was a non-active, was a non-substance, and if anything, perhaps a misinterpretation in particle physics of waves. It's with this intention that they created these designs for giant Zeppelin balloons, which, using magnets and, and copper wheels, would not only fly, but be maneuverable in coordinates, forward-backward, in and out, as well as up down. And certainly, for illustrations from the 19th century, these are very specifically, shall we say, Roswell. There is something rather similar to these designs to actual crafts and Hollywood ones as well, which appeared later in the 20th century for one reason or another. However, these were not made extremely public. Some were made available in the Scientific American Journal but many were only available to members of this very small club. However, this is kind of interesting to me, the period in history before the 20th century when so many phenomena in the sky were being accounted for as identified aerial crafts that had flown over villages and country farms, even cities across Europe. And there are paintings before there are photos. In fact, there's a very different way of looking at these either supernatural phenomena, which could be devilish or divine, or the idea that these are technologies being experimented on by the nobility of these kingdoms. In fact, it seems likely that military were creating crafts as far back as the Crusades, and certainly by the Civil War, there were aerial balloons being used. And the kinds of materials that had been invented by the 19th century, while not yet as strong as later synthetic materials that would be invented in the 20th century, was still possible to create ultralight, airtight, and watertight flying machines. These aerial crafts and drones, sometimes carrying people, and spies were often used in the Civil War and were imperative on both sides. Many of the secrets are not completely understood as, as much of this was never formally declassified, particularly on the Confederate side, where their paperworks were simply absconded with by the Union. However, between submarines and airships lie the Civil War. But of course, going further back, there are pictures of flying ships a thousand years back, maybe more, and even further back in ancient Mesopotamia, in South America and Asia, there are stories of entire legions of occupations and mass exodus, even moon colonization through balloons. And up until now, it's been formally acceptable to postulate that this was simply impossible because they were not modern Europeans. So now that that time is over, I ask the question, are we going to consider that this is possible? Because I'll tell you what, it actually might be. And one of the places we can start to look at verified history about air balloons is in the 17th century in the Occident of France, where in Anonay, the first demonstration to the French royal court was observed. Not to say this is the first flying air balloon, simply the first shown in front of the court to the king to be recorded in our modern history. However, this grand air balloon was more than marvelous. In fact, it was beautiful. It was decorated with sun gods, and eagles, phoenix, and various trappings of ancient mythology. And the use of fire to create the heat to rise the balloon made the airship actually glow. Fabricated supposedly by the Montgolfier brothers, there are them now. Notice the brother with his arm in his jacket pocket. Titled The Aerostatique, the aerostatic first took flight in 1783 when the brothers Joseph Michel and Jacques Etienne Montgolfier were in front of the kingdom when they used smoke from a fire to blow hot air into a silk bag. The silk bag was attached to a basket. The hot air then rose and allowed the balloon to be lighter than air. The first passengers in this aerospace ship were a sheep, a rooster, and a duck, and this climbed to a height of 6,000 feet 
and travels more than one mile. And it's really fascinating that the first balloon that we're allowed to talk about is made of silk, and I'll get into why that is in a minute. But there's so many examples of Zeppelins that come out. In fact, Zeppelin's just the name of one of the inventors of some of these hot air ships. And a number of the designs actually included baskets that people could sit in, boats at first, but wicker baskets make the most sense and are still used to this day because they're organic, ultralight, flexible, biodegradable. It's just something of a testament to the primitive technology that is the hot air balloon. It just shows how old this thing really is that we're still using wicker baskets, albeit much larger. But it looks about the same size when you're an adult. And some of these inventors who are working with these silk airtight wallpapers were making parachutes and all sorts of different flying devices. So it seems that throughout the 1700s, it was a common practice occurrence to try flying in different ways. Although a number of people did seem to die. The technology seriously goes all over the world. In fact, even before the example, maybe by a hundred years, a Brazilian priest had invented hot air balloons. And throughout the world, you'll see examples of silk hot air balloons, especially in China. But before we get into the Tartarian link between Manchurian China and Brazil, let's talk a bit about that priest. And the Brazilian aviation priest of the 1700s name was Bartolomeu de Guzmão, And he himself also fancied the idea of aviation and spent a lot of time working on flying machines. His idea also revolved around a flying balloon. Eventually he went to Portugal to show his design to the King of Portugal and successfully demonstrated an air balloon in the Portuguese court years before the Montgolfier brothers. Of course, the Montgolfier brothers get a lot of credit. It could be perhaps because Portugal was less enthusiastic about this invention than they should have been. It could also be because Anane Occitania is a place with a very vast, deep history and a mythology that goes back thousands of years to the Moorish times of Tartaria and believed in flight. And in their legends, there are the prehistorical accounts of flight. It could also be something about whatever's in Joseph Michel's sleeve. Whatever the reason, the aerostatic is basically considered the first flying craft, kind of tragic because it ended up crashing. However, the name is interesting, the aerostatique. The static is an interesting word. Static, as far as we know etymologically, goes back at least to the 1630s and refers to pertaining to the science of weight and its mechanical effects from the modern Latin of statica, from Greek statikos, causing to stand, skilled in weighing from the stem of histone to make stand or to set, to place in the balance. From the earlier statical in the 1540s, the sense of having to do with bodies at rest or with the forces that balance each other. So static is a pretty interesting word when referring to flight because the physics of tension tether, which using a form of electrostatic magnetism, polarize ions gripping a material to a substrate or surface, a physical phenomenon which we refer to as electrostatic tethering, something that spiders use in order to shoot themselves above their net in order to use the functioning jet propulsion of expulsion of that spider silk in order to literally fly. In creating this electrostatic tether, a fun experiment is often to rub a balloon on a cotton sweater and leave it attached to yourself because it will stay tethered. In the same sense, there are many people that hope to create a graphene spiderweb elevator because of the electromagnetic friction cause great amounts of energy to be stored in the tether, perhaps 70 to 1,000 times more than the amount of energy than we've ever used in the last 100 years combined, also making it possible to attach an elevator to that tether and to bring that elevator above the clouds. Simply using the magnetic field line and electrostatic voltage, this complicated relationship between charge, ampage, voltage, and polarity would make it possible for many balloons to fly safely, be controlled, and even be landed in emergencies safely. So what exactly happened to the balloon future of the 1700s Franco futurism? One of the guys who gets credit for testing the Montgolfier balloon is Jean-Francois Pilotre Rosier, and he made the first man free balloon flight in November 1783, crossing Parisian River. The successful attempt encouraged many people. However, the difficulty in landing, as well as the difficulty in continual fuel burn without a stable source of fuel at the time meant that the balloon rides were rather short. In Bartolomeu de Guzmão's invention, as a priest and naturalist, 
and a pioneer of the lighter-than-airship design. Guzmao's initial designs were small and intended more as drones. For whatever reason, the Portuguese court was not impressed and did not see the efficacy of producing larger balloons for people, and in many ways it seemed that they considered him heretical, so he was silenced and sent back to the strange Brazil. It could also be thought that this demonstration of new technology coming from the colonies frightened the Portuguese, who saw the end of their own power, as if performing a Roswell UFO experiment in front of the Queen of England. The terrified Portuguese court did not know where to turn. Where oh, is, is this airing right now? Is this Reason to this program Harry is coming to you by a Relay 2 satellite, a spacecraft orbiting the Earth at a speed of over 17,000 miles per hour. Hey, everybody, tune in to Reason Tartarian. Reason Tartarian. Exertus.